Praise the Lord, saints. We are continuing our series entitled, The Consequences of Halting Between Two Opinions. And our text scripture is 1 Kings 18, verses 20 and 21. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, Not a word. Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise for giving us the opportunity to partake of your word once again. We thank you, Father, that your word is pure. It's breathed out of the throne room of God. It has everything in it to give us wisdom, to guide us to salvation, to show us the path of our life that we need to proceed on, to strengthen us when we need it, to reprove us when we need to be corrected, to just do everything that's necessary in our life pertaining to life and godliness. We thank you, Father, that it not only does um, miraculous things in our lives, but it also gives us the capacity to minister in the lives of others. And we just thank you, Father, for this. So we just praise you right now, Father, as we continue to study this series, Lord, that if we're dealing with any major decisions, that we would not halt between two opinions, but we would um, abide by your word as well as the insight that you give us via the holy spirit to illuminate it we thank you and give you the praise honor and glory for these things in the precious name of jesus we pray amen praise the lord all right so we have been talking about halting between two opinions and we're not talking about a fork in the road we're talking about quite frankly trying to go down both forks of the road if we use that illustration. And that's the case of people jumping back and forth. One day you're doing it the Lord's way, the next you might be doing it the world's way. And as I said, you might not be in a situation where you're dealing with the specific options that are presenting here, whether you're going to serve God or Baal. Most of us, quite frankly, don't go around thinking about Baal on a daily basis, amen? Neither do we think about, oh, am I gonna, am I gonna serve Satan or be deceived by Satan? But you can definitely choose between I'm doing it God's way and times where you know you're violating scripture and your perceptions, your attitude, your body language, your conduct. You know, we know a lot of times when we're not on God's path. And sometimes it might even have the appearance. Well, I am blessing people. I'm praying for people. I'm walking in Christian character. But there's still times, you know, like, no, God didn't tell you to go in that direction. You could be over there. So. No, we got to stop halting between opinions and just honor what God is telling us to say. So earlier on, we had talked about when we started the series, are you halting between two opinions? Um, and we looked at some examples of that. We went on and the next major subtopic was the two opinions. Once again, was it whether it's God's or if it's something that the flesh uh, the world system is, you know, urging you to do. Uh, after that, we looked at the fact that, uh, is the Lord your God? Because the question was asked, is, if the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. You know, when we're compromising, are we truly saying that the Lord is our God? You know, and you might worship him. You might inherit eternal, eternal life, but are you fully committed that he's my God? I'm doing it his way, no matter what the consequences, no matter what the sacrifices. I'm on team God, and I ain't trying to hear any of that compromise stuff. Amen. Is the Lord your God? Do you fully trust him? After that, we looked at the fact that God is not double-minded. So are we. <laughs> and then last week, I think it was last, yeah, last week, we looked at the fact uh, why are you silent? We got to the end of this. It says that Elijah issued the question, the challenge. You know, how long are you going to waver or halt between two opinions? And he said, if the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. And it said the people had no response. 
silenced due to their hypocrisy and their compromise. Now we're going to continue on this week in our first major subtopic is, do you need a sign from God to follow him? Amen. Do you need a sign from God to follow him? And even in the story, we can see where people might not necessarily admit that, but when circumstances present themselves, they actually reveal that they were looking for God to do something specific for them to say, I have faith in you. Amen. Because when Elijah is posing the question here, you know, who are you serving? They didn't answer. But then let's go down to the same chapter <clears throat> later on. We're going to look at verses 36 through 39. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. Now look at that. These are the same people back in our text scripture <laughs> he says, hey, if the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. The people are silent, had nothing to say. But oh, now we get further on. After Elijah has them bring the animal sacrifices, he pours water on it. Then he tells the people, no, that's not enough water. Bring more water. No, no, more, more urns of water. And they not only saturated the animals with water, but it was so much water that it filled up a trench that was surrounding it. Now, with all that water, it would be very difficult to light the wood, let alone consume the animals that were on the altar. And yet, he had them do all that, saturated the wood and everything with water to make it extremely difficult to get the, the first people piece of wood lit. Now, I know if somebody has a wood burning stove, sometimes you got to fight with that thing for a while mm -hmm. before it really starts going. And now you can throw pieces of wood in the rest of the night and bam, it just burns them up. Sometimes that can be difficult. And especially if the wood is wet, we've had times where I had wood um, out in the backyard with a tarp over it and either it rained a lot or snowed. And so, as, as the snow or the water sometimes gets into like little rips that I might not have seen in the tarp and the wood gets a little saturated, I put that wood in there like, oh, man. And as you're trying to light it, you can hear like popping and crackling and the steam of the wood being, the water being, and the wood being vaporized. It's hard to get that wood to get lit. And sometimes I would actually have to take the, some of the wood out because it was just too damp, use drier wood, use more things to start the wood, and then once it would get, get to a certain amount of heat, 500 degrees or something, then it doesn't matter. Even if I put a wet piece of wood in, you're going to hear the sizzling of the water vapor, vaporizing and it's going to burn. But he didn't do any of this. I mean, he basically <laughs> saturated the stuff. He didn't fight with it. He didn't have to try to get a little piece over here or something burning and then gradually build up. He called down fire that consumed everything, including the water, immediately. And now we see that the same people that he asked the question, you know, if the Lord be God, follow him. If Baal be, be, be God, follow him. They sit and look stupid. Hip knowing they're hypocritical, scared to give a response, not knowing the response, unwilling to commit. I mean, think of all the times that you've posed questions being in an authoritative position with somebody or in a conversation, and you ask them something, and they don't answer you, not a word. It's because they're, they're guilty or they know they busted. There's some negative reason 
why they don't answer. Because you know, when people got something to say mm -hmm. and they think they got enough things to back up what they have to say, most people, you got to shut them up, not try to get them to talk. So these people could not talk. But now, after this flaming fire comes down and burns up everything, including all the water, all of a sudden, these people have commitment. The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Why couldn't you say that before Elijah did that? Mm -hmm. After all, this is the same God that performed miracles. Amen. He got you, the people, through, you know, all the conflicts with Egypt. You know, he enabled them to overcome all the various adversaries that had come their way. Um, so many things that he had done to bless them throughout the generations, and yet they still wavered back and forth in, in their devotion to God. I mean, how many signs do you get? Do you need to see to trust in God? And we can apply that in our lives as, as well. How many miracles had God done for us only for us to be at a fork in a road where we have to make a decision of, I'm going to follow God or bail, and we're still sitting there, oh, I'm not quite sure. Like, you're not at a place after what God has done with you that you cannot say, the Lord, he is God, and even if I'm wrong, I'm going to follow him. Even if I die, I'm going to commit to him. The Lord is my God. Or are you still at the place in your life and in your spiritual journey that you need a sign from heaven? Well, when God shows me something, man, that's that Janet Jackson Christianity. What have you done for me lately? <laughs> you know, if God never does another thing for us, we should be at a place of commitment in our lives that if the question is asked, if the Lord be Lord, follow him. If the world system, you know, we can modernize it. We don't have to use some old, you know, God from the Bible. But if the Lord be God, follow him. If the world system, the, the world of carnality, the world of the flesh is God, follow that. And we should be able to say, no, I'm sticking to God. I'm sh totally sure that. I'm not going to compromise. I do have a, a confident answer that the Lord is my God. But unfortunately, we probably still have a lot of people in this day and age, well, he is my God, but I got a shortcut over here. But these people are going to hook me up. And I can sit here and pray and pray and pray for God to come through. Or here they are. They got something right in hand to give me. God won't mind if I, if I just go ahead and take that route or accept that thing or get that hook up. No, maybe God will. <laughs> so like I said, it's a shame that, oh, these people are so full of conviction and confidence and boldness at professing their God. Look at that. When they saw it, they fell on their faces and now they're proclaiming the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. They should have been able to do that when Elijah right. posed the question. And that is the thing, once again, that is shameful. And here's the thing. Did they fall down and say, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God, out of true conviction? Or was it maybe a little bit of fear? Well, shoot, he just consumed <laughs> a, a water-drenched sacrifice I better drop to my knees and say, the Lord, he is God, the Lord is God, or the fire might spread over here. So even then, did they truly have conviction that the Lord is my God? And then you have to ask yourself, the next time a situation presented itself where they have to choose, if the Lord be God, follow him, if Baal be God, follow him, would they end up back at the same fork in the road? once again forgetting the miracles of God that they literally saw in their lives. We have no guarantee that these people change permanently. The rest of my life, after I've seen this, follow, this fire come down, for the rest of my life, I will never doubt God again. I will never compromise. I'm always going to say the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. No, we don't know that. So we have to challenge ourselves. I mean, these stories are in here for a reason. If the Lord were to ask us today in regard to the situations, the problems, the crises, 
the goals, all the various things that are in our life right now as we're looking out at some decisions we might have to make. Is the Lord our God? Are we remembering the blessing from the past? Or are we looking for another sign that the Lord is still God? Because he might be your God that you have a bold profession about while he's directly intervening in your life. But what about a month, a week, a year from now? Are you still dropping down, the Lord is my God? Or do you need the next sign of God's divine love and intervention? That really kind of makes God a heavenly sugar daddy. He's my God. As long as I see him doing something. Shouldn't be that way. We should trust him regardless. Amen. All right. Um, and shame, sometimes we trust in people more than we do in God. Where every time I get in trouble, I know I can call so and so. They'll bail me out. Well, what if their cupboard is dry? What if they're in a situation where they can't come through? And they might want to, but can't. You know, the main person that we should always trust should be God. Mm -hmm. Period. And if he does cause somebody else to intervene, look at that as a blessing that God has positioned them to be able to do that. You know, they might be the person saying, Lord. <laughs> All right, so let's go over to Matthew 16, 1 through 4. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. There's several key words in this passage of Scripture that I want to point out. It says, first of all, the Pharisees and Sadducees came and tempting, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. This is not the kind of temptation like lust for money, power, the opposite sex, you know, you know, all these fame and fortune. No, the word tempting here means testing or scrutinizing. This is the word become flesh. This is the only begotten son of God. But it says they are testing and scrutinizing. Let's see what he's made of. Let's see if Jesus is legitimate. And one of the things you got to keep in mind is as they're tempting or testing and scrutinizing him, they're asking him questions or asking him to do something that like, oh, well, we're just saying like, you, you know, you're the son of man, you're the son of God, all these things you're saying and you preaching this stuff and operating signs, miracles, their miracles are one thing. Surely you can show us a sign from heaven. And you might say, like, why did they pick that? But there's a, a definite reason. According to their doctrinal beliefs, somebody could operate in the supernatural. Somebody could work wonders with magic. Um, you could also get the devil himself, you know, satanic agency, to empower you to do various things that would border on or look like they were miracles. So the reasons they specifically asked him for a sign, look at that, show us a sign from heaven. They had a reason that they said that. Because if they just said give him a sign, they already once again knew that there were people that could operate magic and different things. And, okay, I can give you a miracle. I don't prove anything. But if you were really want to prove you're legitimate, give us a sign from heaven. Because only somebody who is sanctioned by God can produce a miracle that comes down from heaven itself. That can only occur if God himself enables you or equips you with the power to be able to produce a sign from heaven. 
So that was specifically why, if you never knew this before, that's why they asked Jesus for a sign from heaven. Because once again, only God or his true servants could produce that sort of thing. You know, we saw signs of that in the Old Testament. Manna during Moses' time coming down to feed the people. There was the staying, staying of the sun and the moon in terms of their position when Joshua had to fight. These were signs that were associated with powerful leaders in the Old Testament. So they knew that there was times where God himself intervened on behalf of his servants to produce something that was a sign from heaven. And they were asking Jesus to do the same thing, you know. But Jesus basically told them, like, he had already given the, the, told them the situation about Jonas, you know, earlier on. If you look earlier back in Matthew, he said, you know, when they also asked him for a sign, he said, the only sign I'm going to give you is that as Jonah was in the belly of the well for three days, three nights, so shall the Son of Man be. So this is not the first time they asked him for a sign from heaven. And he's like, I already told y'all before about Jonas. That's why here he says, no sign will be given unto this wicked, adulterous generation, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And notice that he didn't describe it again. Three days, three nights, blah, 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 so shall I be. He said, the sign of the prophet Jonas he walked away. He's saying, I ain't got time for this. I already told you the sign from heaven that's going to be associated with me. And they couldn't understand it, but you're not going to see the sign during my earthly ministry. After y'all kill me and I'm in the grave, you're going to see the greatest sign you've ever seen from a man of God. As I come back from the tomb, from death itself, and people see me walking around. That's a sign from heaven that you're going to see from me. So he walked away. <laughs> But then let's look at how he addressed them as well. You hypocrites. You look at the sky at night to predict the weather or the sky in the morning to figure out what kind of day it's going to be. And he basically said, you're a bunch of hypocrites. That word hypocrites means you are an actor under a, an assumed character, a stage player. <laughs> He's basically like, Y'all y'all sitting here dressing like you're so spiritual. You got your robes on, your phylacteries, your, your tefillin or whatever, looking all spiritual and walking around your heads up, you know, looking like old old style popes with the robes and everything. He said, you ain't nothing but a bunch of actors. You want to scru scrutinize me? He scrutinized them. You're a bunch of hypocrites. You came here to test me, to try me. You tried to set me up with a request that you thought I wouldn't be able to do so you could prove that I was not genuine. I'm turning that around. I'm calling you a bunch of hypocrites. Amen. You're actors with a pretense. You got on the clothing. You got the mannerisms of a man of God. But he said, you're nothing but actors. You don't really have the true character of God. Because you did, you would not be fighting against me and trying to test me. You would honor me and would be supporting me. He, also, he called them actors, <laughs> stage players. And then he also called them dissemblers and phonies. Instead of you rallying the people to follow me, or at least, you know, being supportive, you are causing chaos to try to drive people away and separate the crowd of people that would be listening to and following me. Then he went on and talked about the generation that seeketh after a sign. He said, only a wicked and adulterous generation pursues these things. The word wicked means evil in effect or influence. Now, instead of them being spiritual, godly men, he says, you are evil in the effect you have upon people and the influence that you bear in the lives of others. You are the opposite of what a godly person should be. And he says, you know, in terms of your essential character, you are degenerates who have nothing to do with the original virtues that God desired of his people. So he said, you're evil in effect, you're degenerates. He says, you cause calamity, and he also says, you're derelicts, you're diseased, you're vicious, and you're culpable for all the things that you do that are ungodly in the lives of other people. 
He said, you're going to be held accountable for your wickedness. You're not just wicked, but you're going to pay the price. You have to give an account. And you're responsible for the negative influence that you have upon people. He calls them also adulterers. And that's a person who renounces their religious beliefs or principles. He's saying you're walking around with the appearance of righteousness. But by your actions and by you trying to scrutinize me and put me up to a test that you think I'll fail so you can now accuse me of not being a true man of God. He said you are actually renouncing the very faith that you espouse as supposed servants of God. You are hypocrites. And then he says, finally, you know, people that seek after, uh, after a sign. You're trying to demand or crave something from God that God did not ordain that I have to sub submit myself to. So I don't have to submit myself to your scrutiny and your testing. I do what God tells me to do, not what you're trying to demand of me. So no, I'm not going to submit myself to your test. <coughs> so Jesus could have produced a true sign of heaven, from heaven, so that they would acknowledge him. But quite frankly, he probably knew in their heart of hearts, even if I did do something that was a sign from heaven, they would still come back later to accuse me even more. It might make them even harsher against me. Amen? And they probably, even if it was something that was truly a sign from heaven, as they did before when he was healing the sick or casting out demons. Oh, he casts out demons by the power of Beelzebub or the devil. So, yeah, I can produce a sign from heaven, but all you're going to do is say, oh, I mean, you can I can produce a sign from heaven, but you're just going to say the devil was behind it. So I'm not submitting myself to your scrutiny. I don't need to pass your tests or gain your approval. It need to be the other way around. I approve you. We have to ask ourselves. You know, bringing this up to our day and age. Number one, are we scrutinizing whether God is true in our lives? Do we truly trust Jesus or are we trying to put him to the test? I'll trust you, Jesus, if you give me that blessing. You know, I have faith in you, God, if I pray and ask for this and it comes into manifestation. Are we testing and tempting God? Or do we just trust him at his word? Are we looking for some miraculous intervention in our lives for God to do? You know, demanding and craving these things from God. Or do we have faith? You know, God has no problem doing miraculous things in our lives. And, you know, producing signs from heaven to um, just work miracles in us as we need them. But there's a difference between God choosing to do these sort of things in our lives and us trying to demand it of God so he can prove himself. God has nothing to prove to anybody. Amen. So we cannot do that sort of thing. And we need to have trust in Jesus no matter what we're seeing going on in our lives. So once again, do we truly have faith in God and his his word, his promises, his character. Do we truly trust him or are we trying to demand something of God for him to prove himself? You know, unfortunately, if we try to make that kind of demand of God, we'll probably have the same result that they had with Jesus. <laughs> they demanded a sign. Jesus told them about themselves and their, hypo and their hypocrisy and he walked away. You don't want to tempt God and say, are you really true? Are you really going to commit yourself to the things that your word says? Quite frankly, if you really look at things, God is always true to his word. The times that we really don't see that happening is because God is probably allowing something to happen to build up our faith or to produce a testimony. But he's still true to his word. And if we truly look at the things he's done in the past, and man, he's already proven himself a, a, a thousand times, a million times or more in terms of his faithfulness, his character, and his promises. So we're never in a place where we can demand or scrutinize something for God. We need to believe them based upon what the word says alone, as well as what the Holy Spirit is revealing to us. Amen.
he owes us nothing, and <laughs> you try to demand something from Jesus and God, you might have them <laughs> may not necessarily walk away in the throne room, but they're probably going to turn a deaf ear to it. They make the demands if there are any, not us. They perform the scrutiny, not us. And we don't want to be found in a place where we're accused of being hypocrites or wicked or adulterous generation because we're trying to demand things of God, especially if we're outside of the character of God. Now right, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 18 through 31. It says, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world, by wisdom, knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised have God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Praise the Lord. So we see here that um, we could try to demand things of God. That's going to be a mission that fails. Um, we could try to compare what God's word is saying versus what the world system is um, trying to teach us. But well, we see here that it says that if we were able to label something within God's divine wisdom foolish, even the most foolish thing of God is greater than the strongest thing of the intellectual world. The same thing would go for weakness. The weakest thing of God is still stronger than anything that this world system has to offer. And that's why Jesus would tell you know people, he who will be last shall be first. And he talks about how the meek you know, will inherit the earth. According to the world system, no, the powerful are the ones who will inherit the earth. But no, God reverses in that and says the meek, those who have childlike or pure hearts, those who have a mindset of servitude, those are the ones who will inherit the earth. So it sounds like that would be an errant way of thinking according to the world system. No, you want to control the world or um, <coughs> take ownership of the world, you need to flex your muscles, wield power, influence, join with other people that have power, and you can rise to the top and be dominant. How many times have we seen that happen, and yet things go tumbling down? So the world has attempted countless times to have power, influence, wealth, all these different things by doing it according to the ways of this world system only for those things to crumble. And that's why we've seen even some of the most powerful empires throughout history. You know, look at the, the you know, uh, Genghis Khan, look at the Ming Dynasty, all these different 
um, empires, the Persian, the Greeks, the Medes, all these empires, like where are most of them today? And matter of fact, if you look at the, the foundation of our country, you know, we're going up Great Britain, the power of the world at the time. And what? A bunch of little colonists get together and beat off a major power. <laughs> now we're in a place that that might be reversed. We've risen up to a place of power that, you know, the country's somewhat arrogant now. And that's why certain smaller things come in and teach us a lesson from time to time. So, um, and then we even see you over to Israel. You know, they're small, very small country. <laughs> I think Texas is bigger. Um, I think. And this, I think it is. Yeah, I think the state of Texas is big, bigger than Israel, if I recall correctly. But yet, how many times has the world come against them to try to exterminate them and like, we still here? <laughs> Small, supposedly weak, turning back major powers that try to destroy them. <laughs> so um, the ways of the world system don't work when God is blessing his people. So we should have the same mindset. You know, why are you seeking a sign from God? Just follow God faithfully. Believe in him and his word. Walk according to his principles. And the world system might laugh at you, yet even though they see you as weak, God is infusing you with strength. Even though the world might think you're foolish, God is giving you divine revelation that enables you to overcome all the schemes of the enemy. Amen. God does not work like the world system, nor does he have to. Um, and that's why we can glory in God. And, you know, once we're faced with that decision, you know, am I going to glory in God and trust in God or am I going to trust in the world system? We should have the faith to glory in the Lord as we see at the last sentence or verse of this passage. Amen. Glory in God because he guarantees you that you're going to do things. The problem with the world system is that the world, you know, glorifies itself according to the flesh and its attributes. But God says no flesh is going to glory in my presence. You can't win in the kingdom of God trying to gain victories with your flesh. It's taking God's glory away. So you want to be big, you want to be strong, you want to be powerful. Number one, that need to be yielded to God. I don't want to be big and glamorous and wealthy and powerful for me and my, myself and I, if I'm going to rise up to the top, is to give me more leverage, Lord, to bring about your glory and honor and let people know about you. Amen? Praise God. So we need to glory in him, and we need to have a bold profession that he is Lord, and I'm abiding by his ways. So we asked, you know, first subtopic today, do you need a sign from God to follow him. And we saw that God is not going to give you a sign. You know, God has no problem with producing signs in your life, but he is not under your demand. You know, you ain't going to like God, like he's Netflix or mm -hmm. Amazon Prime. and like, what do I want to see from you today? There you go. Give me that sign, God. No, <laughs> God ain't playing with your subscription methods and your demands. <laughs> you got to be faithful and, and, and humble and have a, a mindset of humility to go to God. And God has no problem with pouring out his signs from heaven, his miracles in your life. So once you reach this conclusion that, okay, I do want to follow God. And if I am at a fork in the road, I'm not going to bounce back and forth, but I really want to commit myself to God. That's where it brings me to the next sub subtopic. Are you all in with God? Amen. We should not be, as we've seen over the last few weeks, we should not be halting, wavering, jumping, dancing, hesitating between two opinions, God's and the world's. No, we should be all in with God. And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Are we at the place where we're all in with God? No matter what we see, no matter what we hear, even though it might appear that we're going to encounter difficulties and setbacks, are we all in with God? Um, let's look at Psalms 86. And we'll look at verses 6 through 10. 
Give ear, O Lord, unto my prayer, and attend to the voice of my supplications. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon thee, for thou wilt answer unto me. Among the gods there is none like unto thee, neither are there any works like unto thy works. All nations whom thou hast made shall come and worship before thee, O Lord, and shall glorify thy name. For thou art great, and doest wondrous things, thou art God alone. It's like a pole thing. Sorry, yeah, no problem. All right, so as we see here, we need to first of all give ear to God as he speaks to us. Amen. Have an open ear to his guidance, to his revelation, to what he wants us to do in our lives on a daily basis. And then as we're listening to God, we can also interact and say, you know, I want to present my prayer request unto you and believe that you're going to listen to my voice when I'm presenting supplications. And as we see here, in the day of trouble, we will call on the Lord and we have an expectation that God will answer me. Verse 8 is where we really come into that fork in the road. Amen. The two opinions. Because there are gods of this world system, small g gods. Amen. Gods of power, fame. The God of mammon is still highly present as people are chasing after money. Um, the same gods with a small g that were present um, during biblical times and before the writing of the scriptures. Amen. They're the same spirits that are out there. You know, repackaged, renamed. You know, you, like I said, you won't hear Baal today. Um, and you probably won't even hear Satan so much today. But the spirits behind these false gods and deities, small g gods, they're still present, you know, tempting people, causing them to do various things, making them perceive things in a certain way, and really deceiving uh, and seducing the hearts of of men and women worldwide. And that's why you're seeing the rise in so many heinous things. Um, just crazy things. And some of the things we couldn't even imagine that we thought, like, this is the worst it could get. And we're seeing even worse things rising up on a daily basis. You know, places that used to be safe. Now it's like murders all the time. You know, just, just crazy stuff going on all over the place. You know, you, you thought there were certain things, places that were always safe. A church, a synagogue, uh, a mosque is always safe. You're shooting those up. Years ago, like, okay, I might harm you, but I won't go to a, a house of worship. They don't care. Um, families, you know, uh, we might separate a divorce, but, you know, certain lines you won't cross in a family. And now we see, as the word warned us, you know, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, parents and children, <clears throat> warring and killing each other. These are the sort of things that are happening. So these are because of the gods of this world, but we need to have a mindset that among the gods, amen, there is none like thee, O Lord, and you are the only God that I bend my knee to. And quite frankly, because of our allegiance and devotion and love for him, that is the thing that will prevent us from being pulled away entangled, um, destroyed, or controlled by the false gods of this world system. Amen? That's one of the things that will keep us, you know, free of the shackles that the world system will throw on us. And it'll try to have all these things repackaged, you know, philosophies and principles like, oh, well, that's old-fashioned. Nowadays, we can accept this or that. There's no harm and just lure you in more and more. It's the same repackaged spirits, the same false gods that were present, you know, going back to the earliest biblical days. Um, but we need to have a mindset that there's no God like the one true God. And no matter what the world throws at me and no matter how it tries to convince me that the things that were corrupt and are now acceptable should be things I should accept. And, oh, well, 
oh, you're too hardcore in the Bible, and, you know, that was back then, but you need to rethink some of these things because, you know, the people that wrote the Bible, here's the things you hear. They're all men, or they're this, or they didn't understand the things we would face nowadays, so you can throw that out, and you can accept it. No, no, no. That's things that are false from this world system that the world is trying to deceive us into. Amen. And I'm of the mindset that if God um, created all things and God is perfect and all powerful and omniscient and all knowing, you know, when he, he, not men, inspired men to write this, he knew exactly what needed to be in there. And I believe he's powerful enough to create a universe. He is powerful enough that even if group, groups of religious elders got together to, you know, go back and forth over what should be in here. He had control of that process. So all that, you know, well, it was just a bunch of men, blah, 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 and they threw this together, and they didn't even agree. I ain't trying to hear that. I can't trust him for eternal life if I can't trust him that the greatest handwritten work that was produced by him is inaccurate or invalid. I'm sorry, I can't trust you that when this body dies, I will never die. How can I trust you if I can't trust the book that's supposed to be ordained by you? That's too big a leap. I can't trust you that I'll never die if I can't trust you that you couldn't even protect what's in the book. I mean, so I have to trust that book as part of my faith. I mean, that's what gets me when people are like, oh, well, you know, that's out of date. And, you know, well, I, I just can't deal with that. I, I can't trust God. If I can't trust him for that, I can't trust him for the bigger things, eternal life, defeating the kingdom of darkness, recreating this earth and making it pure again, cleansing the heavens. Those are so much bigger <laughs> than a book. So that's that's my that's my line and I'm sticking to it. You know? Uh, so I, I have to believe him at his word. And like I said, among the gods, there is none like unto you. So it's not saying here that there aren't other gods. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people say, there are, there are no other gods, there's only one God. No, there's some false gods. There are some false gods around here running around causing trouble. You know, that's the, they don't get any glory. That's why they're small G. But there's some false ones out here. We need to realize that they exist and they're trying to lure, lure you and change your thought process and lead you astray. God never tells us, he tells us not to worship the other gods. He didn't say, don't acknowledge them pretend they don't exist and stuff like that. How can you fight them if you don't think they exist? No, he tells us to wage war against the principalities and powers, rulers of darkness and high places. So they do exist, but yet we have to continue to say there is none like the one we serve. Amen. So if I am faced with the decision over who I will swear my allegiance to, who I have confidence in and who I will follow, I'm only going to follow the one true capital G. The G ain't big enough, God. Amen. The almighty Lord God, creator of all things, heaven and earth. And he created those false gods, but they blew it. They had their chance. They screwed up. <laughs> and now they're trying to mess us up. No. Uh-uh. <laughs> That's why y'all got cast out of heaven, you losers. <laughs> Try to take the throne from God. And he just like probably took his pinky and cast them out of heaven if that so we will not bow down to any other gods and we need to continue to confess that there is none like you and then neither are there any works like unto your works not only is God the greatest that ever existed but everything that he created there is nothing greater than his works so the enemy would try to uh, establish design or build things to lead us astray or to try to give us an impression that we need to do things according to the world system because that will give us the desires that we need in life. Those are all trinkets and things that will fail. And the devices and the revelation and the tools that God gives us are also greater than anything that the world system um, will have. And that's why he's, you know, Elijah's posing the question to these people, how long are you going to Waver. He's probably looking at it like, what's wrong with you people? Mm -hmm. Like one day you you trusting in God, and the next you, you see all over here, you know they're sacrificing the, the Baal, and y'all sitting around there, you know some of y'all trying to pretend like, oh I'm just here, I ain't, I'm not engaged. 
you probably like, I'm seeing some of y'all starting to bend the knee and you know, they're chanting and you starting to join in. He probably saw that compromise. Like how you, how you wavering between, between two opinions and think you're going to be blessed. Amen. Stand firm and stand true to your trust in the one true God. So we see here the glory of God. Amen. He is, there's none like him. There are no works like his. And all the nations shall come and worship before him. And that's a wonderful day because the world system, they think they can rise up, you know, and keep building these greater and greater works, you know. And, you know, back in the Old Testament, they tried the Tower of um, Babel. Um, today, was it the, was it Khalifa? The Burj Khalifa, you know, trying to build their towers up to the heavens. And God's just laughing. It's like, <laughs> y'all still trying to, to get up, build these higher and higher things to try to elevate yourselves up to, to glory. And the only way to reach, to reach my heights is to go low and bend your knee to me. God has no problem with us being in heights, but we're going to do it his way. And we see here every nation, no matter how high they try to exalt himself, he says that all nations shall come and worship him. See, we're getting a gentle, patient God right now. The day is going to come when Jesus is basically going to make every nation, every person alive bend their knee, whether you like it or not. That's going to be a scary day for some people because in their heart, they probably be like, I will never bend. You better do it. I ain't been, I've never been. You might start hearing some, le some legs cracking. <laughs> Oh, broke my knees. You're going to bend. Because <laughs> when that day comes, there ain't going to be no choice. You will bend your knees and bow before me. Amen. <laughs> Whether you like it or not. And for those who do not come and give me the honor I de deserve, he will stop the rain. <laughs> stuff like that. They won't have crops and stuff. You're going to bend your knee to Jesus. So it's better for us to do it now and not to compromise and in action, heart, faith, or trust to bend our knee to anything else. We should have the mindset, as we see here, that God is great and does wondrous things. And he is the only God. And when we have that mindset about God, amen, then we will not be wavering between two opinions. I'm going to give one final one for today. Acts 13. 17 through 22, the God of this people of Israel chose our fathers and exalted the people when they dwelt as strangers in the land of Egypt, and with an high arm brought he them out of it. And about the time of 40 years suffered he their manners in the wilderness. And when he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he divided their land to them by lot. And after that, he gave unto them judges about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. And afterward, they desired a king. And God gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. And that's one thing that really shows us, amen. We could commit to God and not waver between our opinions while still being fallible. God did not call him. Notice that. It says, he raised and gave unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony. God gave a testimony of him, just like he did about Job. And the testimony was is that he's a man after my own heart who will fulfill all my will. Wow. We know David struggled with certain things. And I'm sure those things were not what God wanted him to do. So for God to say that he would fulfill all my will, he's basically saying, even despite his sins and his imperfections that I had to judge, where he ended up losing a child um, that was born of that situation. 
Um, so I did chastise my son, but he still saw him as a man will fulfill all his will because when I told him to do things regarding my people and the nation and various kingdoms that he needed to fight against, he always did everything I told him to do. So there are times where we might be faced with a situation where we could halt between two opinions. You know, don't think that you have to be Mr. or Ms. Perfect. No, God knows that we have shortcomings. And there's times where he has to chastise us. Um, but even in the midst of our imperfections, we could be perfect in terms of fulfilling the overall, overall will of God as he directs us. So our mindset should be, I'm going to do what God wants me to say. I'm going to try my best to walk in righteousness without sin. But thinking that we have to be, once again, perfect is something that is not necessary. Is it desired? Yes. But even in our shortcomings, and it doesn't have to be sin. Some of us might lack confidence. Some of us might have anxieties. There's different areas where we might struggle. Um, and yet we can still fulfill all God's will if as he leads us, we don't halt between two opinions. We have the commitment in our minds that what God tells me to do, I'm going to do it. Even if I'm struggling myself, even if I failed in this area, even if I have medical issues, um, anxieties, things from my past. You know, I'm going to try my best to still fulfill um, the plan and follow the course that God has given me for my life. And that being the case, God can, you know, give the testimony about us that that person will fulfill my will, even in their imperfections. Amen. So we're going to stop there today. Thank you, God, for the time that we have as usual. Heavenly Father, in the precious name of Jesus, we give you the glory, honor, and praise. Just thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to partake of your word. And we thank you, Father, that although we may struggle from time to time, or maybe constantly with various imperfections, falls, shortcomings, or even the ways that we perceive ourselves, we praise you, Father, that we might have some doubts about or, uh, ourselves or a lack of faith in ourselves, but we, we pray, Father, that we're at the point that as it relates to your will for our lives and the path that you have for us to take, whenever we are facing major decisions regarding our individual walk with you um, in the midst of our relationships with others, uh, as it relates to our careers, um, the body of Christ, any major things of significance that we face, that we would not halt between two opinions, but instead we would trust you even if we don't fully understand. Once we have heard the path or the, the mindset or the course of action that we are called to take and we know that we've clearly heard you, we praise you, Father, that we would not vacillate back and forth between um, the two systems, your system versus the world's, but instead we will be locked in to doing things according to your spirit that are critical for what you have us to do in our life and for your kingdom. We thank you, Father, for this. We praise you, Father, for strengthening us in the times that we are weak. And we know, Father, that we obey you. Uh, you give us the power to be able to overcome every obstacle and the anointing to produce um, blessings, healings, deliverance, salvation, and every fruitful work that you've ordained for us. We just continue to thank you, Father, for this, and we give you the praise, honor, and glory for these things. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.